Hello everyone uh, and welcome to this new appointment with the interviews of uh, Ottolina TV's English channel. Today we have the great, great honor of hosting our uh, absolute favorite uh, economist, the legendary Michael Hudson, uh, to whom we owe some of the most important uh, tools we have today uh, to gain a better understanding of the problems and of the crisis uh, that surround us. Uh, first of all, uh, um, really welcome uh, Michael and thank you so much for uh, accepting our invitation. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Michael. We have so many, so many things to ask you, so let's, uh, let's just jump straight into it. Uh, Michael, uh, that would be the first question. Um, as President uh, Xi Jinping continually repeats, uh, uh, the international system is going through a phase uh, of great changes uh, never seen in a century. Uh, mainstream geopolitical analysts uh, read these changes uh, exclusively from the point of view of uh, conflicting state powers, uh, as if the conflicting blocs uh, essentially shared uh, the same development model. Uh, but you, on the other hand, uh, underline how at the roots of the conflict uh, there are different and maybe opposite uh, development models. Uh, so could you try please to explain us briefly uh, what these two development uh, models consist of and uh, why they would be uh, not uh, uh, compatible uh, with each other? Well, there is a reason that uh, uh, President Xi mentioned uh, the century ago, and that century ago was World War I. And World War I changed the whole trajectory of uh, capitalism uh, evolving. Throughout the 19th century, uh, capitalism was British political economy, uh, from Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill to Marx and, and the socialists. Uh, the idea was to free industrial capitalism from the legacy of feudalism. It was to get rid of the landlord class. It was to get rid of monopolies. Uh, and it was to have uh, the landlord class and the rentier class uh, replaced by, uh, by socialism. By the end of uh, the 19th century and in the decades le le leading up to World War I, everybody was talking about socialism in one form or another. And the question was, what kind of socialism was the world going to have? Uh, everybody expected the government to take uh, 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 basic uh, needs, uh, monopolies, into the public domain. And uh, this was what classical value and price theory was all about. The purpose of Smith and uh, Ricardo and John Stuart Mill and Marx and Alfred Marshall was to say, what is the difference between value and price. Why are some uh, goods and services uh, priced much higher than actual cost value? And the purpose of this value theory was to explain economic rent is unearned income. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Real estate, uh, for instance, housing had two costs. There was the cost of building uh, the house, but there was also the payment for the land in the form of land rent. And the one common denominator of all of British political economy and the first item of Marx's and Engels' Communist Manifesto was uh, that uh, land rent should not go to a landlord class. That was the residue of the Nordic invasions of, of Europe in the uh, 10th and 11th and 12th century. Uh, the, the government should actually be the recipient of land rent. And uh, instead of uh, the landlords uh, collecting all the rent and taxing uh, labor and taxing industrial capital, it's, uh, the, the land rents should be taxed away so you wouldn't have a landlord class. Uh, and you had uh, governments uh, taking the role in all the basic public utilities, transportation, communication, the post office, public health. And the idea is that uh, governments would provide basic needs at low cost or even freely. Education would be free. Healthcare would be free. And uh, communications and uh, money uh, would be provided uh, at some a subsidized uh, rate. 
And the idea was that by uh, providing the basic needs at a subsidized rate by government, em employers, industrial employers, would not have to pay their labor force enough money to pay a landlord class in, uh, in rent. They wouldn't have to pay monopolists for communications and transportation. Uh, they would be a low-cost uh, economy. And the whole aim of industrial capitalism was to lower the cost of doing business and to lower the cost of labor, of, of, of living. Because if you lowered the cost of living and doing business, you could compete with other countries and undersell them. And uh, the way to lower costs was to move towards socialism. And that's why everybody thought, uh, especially the Marxists, thought that the uh, natural tendency of industrial capitalism was to evolve into socialism. That's what made industrial capitalism radical. It was getting rid of the landlord class that had dominated Europe for a thousand years. Well, World War I changed a lot of this. Uh, it uh, was replaced by uh, essentially finance capitalism. Uh, the United States insisted on uh, uh, its allies paying its uh, debts uh, for the arms that it had sent Europe, uh, England and France and other countries before uh, America had entered into the war. Uh, the, uh, the allies turned to Germany to demand reparations. And uh, essentially this led to the Great Depression and that led to World War II. And you could look at World War II as the final settlement of the World War I crisis. Uh, because at the end of World War II, uh, you'd finally got rid of the debts that were uh, building up uh, during the 1930s. Uh, you had, uh, in 1945, you had industry and labor emerging basically debt-free. And uh, by being debt-free, uh, you had housing at a, a very low price. You had governments uh, having uh, taken over much of the public utility utilities, and uh, it seemed to be that uh, capitalism uh, was somehow able to manage finance much better after 1945. But obviously, uh, this didn't work. Uh, uh, you, you had the uh, uh, landlord sector, the monopolist sector, and the financial sector fighting back against classical economics and against the whole logic that had led to socialism. And this already had begun before uh, World War I, already in the 1890s. Uh, you had, in America, John Bates Clark, and in uh, Europe, uh, the Austrians, saying there's no difference between price and value. Uh, there's no such thing as unearned income. Landlords make an income by providing the service of deciding who to rent out their lands to. And banks uh, create a service by deciding who to lend money to. And the pretense was that banks would lend money to uh, industrialists to uh, build factories and employ labor, and uh, somehow banks would finance industrial capitalism. Well, that isn't how things have worked out. Uh, leading up to World War II, uh, up to World War I, uh, as I've explained in my book uh, on uh, killing the host, uh, Germany, indeed had uh, a kind of socialist banking. Germany had banking actually making loans to heavy industry, especially the war industries. But British banking, American banking, uh, had always predatory loans. And uh, if you look at today, banks do not finance building of factories. They uh, do finance uh, speculators buying an industrial company and then breaking it up turning it into gentrified real estate, breaking it up into parts, loading it down with debt, and driving it bankrupt. Uh, the, the role of finance today is not to help industrial capitalism, but to deindustrialize and to finance the economy. And it turned out uh, into exactly the opposite of where industrial capitalism was moving. It turned into basically a rolling back of economies back towards uh, feudalism. So the key to understanding what today's fight is, uh, how do countries resist this uh, retrogression, this reactionary 
financialization that has polarized the uh, 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 Western economies between uh, creditors, uh, the wealthiest 10% of the population, and debtors, the 90% 90, the 90 of the population. Industry, labor, even governments uh, have been uh, increasing uh, their debt. And what was the landlord class in the 19th century living as a free lunch, making income in their sleep, as John Stuart Mill put it, uh, is now the financial class. Uh, the financial class is the main rent-seeking class, and uh, that is, is stifling industrial capitalism. So when I talk about a different system, uh, the different system required a violent social revolution, and that was uh, Mao's revolution uh, in China. And uh, the distinguishing feature of China's alternative to the United States is to keep money as a public utility. If money is a public utility and money is socialized and kept in the public domain, then it's the treasury that creates money by spending it into the economy. Uh, the, uh, a socialized economy will create money to, to finance industrial investment, to build housing, to providing means of production instead of uh, buying uh, assets that are already in place. In the West, 80% of uh, bank loans in the United States and England are real estate mortgages, almost entirely to buy housing that's already in existence. And the effect of lending against uh, housing is uh, to raise the price of housing to however much a bank is going to lend. And uh, uh, in 1945, to 1980, uh, in the United States, you had uh, labor paying maybe 25% of its income uh, maximum for um, either a mortgage uh, to, to, for its own housing or rent to rent housing. Now that rate has gone up to 43% uh, that's guaranteed by the government to the banks. And if uh, just imagine if labor has to pay 43% of its income for housing, instead of 25%, it has less money, 18% of its income that used to be paid on buying the goods and services that labor produced is no longer available for this. It's paid to the bankers. And so what you have is uh, what was called debt deflation in the 1930s. Uh, the economy has more and more debt growing exponentially and uh, is more uh, income is paid to the bankers, the economy slows down. So you have a slowing industrial economy and a rising wealth of uh, creditors on uh, the uh, other side of the balance sheet, and they make their money by <laughs> charging, uh, pushing the 90% of the population into debt. That's not how uh, China works. So uh, the, the conflict of systems you have is the conflict that seemed to be developing on the eve of World War I between uh, industrial capitalism becoming socialist in Germany and uh, finance capitalism rolled back towards feudalism uh, in the United States uh, and in England. So that's basically the, uh, the, the choice that is happening today is now polarizing. Uh, it's, it's, it's making this fight that uh, the industrial capitalist won uh, in the 19th century into a fight in which the finance capital is uh, winning against indus in industrial capital uh, today. That's uh, basically how the world is dividing into two different economic systems. Not the same economic system. It's not that China is trying to rival the United States in industrial production. The United States doesn't want industrial production. If the United States were to have industrial production, that would raise the price of labor. And the objective of uh, the United States uh, finance capitalism is uh, to put the class war back in business, to keep labor down. And whenever you've seen the Federal Reserve chairman in the United States say that uh, when uh, labor's wages go up, we're going to raise interest rates to bring on a depression. We uh, are the American policy, the English policy, the European policy is to create a permanent industrial depression to prevent labor from uh, increasing its uh, 
uh, its wages. And uh, if you stop labor from raising its wages, you stop labor productivity. And you also stop industrial uh, investment. So it's not that there's a rivalry between uh, the West and uh, China and Eurasia. It's that the, the West doesn't want industrial capitalism. Eurasia does. So that's how the world is dividing up. But I mean, uh, could these two different model uh, uh, live uh, uh, together in different part of the world, or one absolutely the, the only way is that one of the two prevail globally? I, I, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Uh, if these two system. Yeah. can live together in the world like one uh, in uh, the West Hemisphere yeah. and the other one uh, in the Eurasian uh, uh, supercontinent, yeah. or one of the two have to prevail somehow? Well, the United States uh, has interfered with uh, uh, European and uh, the Global South uh, regimes. Uh, in Italy, for instance, as you know, the United States backed... Uh, Uh, opposition to the socialist parties. It did so in a violent way. Uh, the United States has defended its uh, finance capitalism. It's defended its opposition to socialism by uh, supporting uh, uh, alternatives. Uh, it, it's uh, non-government organizations, such as the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, and most violently, the CIA, uh, has said uh, they're willing to actually uh, kill Uh, leaders who have threatened to uh, promote socialism and uh, use industrialization to raise living standards and to become independent. So what was a, uh, an intellectual uh, discussion over what kind of economy do we want in the 19th century has now become a violent uh, military uh, confrontation and a policy of regime change <clears throat> that has uh, seen the United States interfere uh, with uh, uh, European development. Uh, with, uh, especially you see that in Germany. So the leaders of, uh, of Britain, the leaders of Germany, uh, Scandinavia, uh, are all basically loyal to the United States as the protector. You can think of the European leaders much like Latin American client oligarchies. Just as America has supported dictators violently, Throughout Latin America, it supported uh, uh, the same kind of local oligarchs uh, uh, in Europe that are not only supporting uh, uh, finance capitalism, but specifically American-style finance capitalism, with America creating uh, uh, the, uh, the money supply by uh, running a budget, uh, a, a balance of payments deficit as a result of its military spending pushing dollars into the international economy that have become the international reserves of uh, all the Western countries uh, in, and also uh, China and uh, Russia until America began to grab uh, uh, Russia's international reserves, just as it had grabbed Venezuela's uh, gold uh, in, that was in the Bank of England and just as it had grabbed uh, Iran's uh, reserves before. So the United States realizes that uh, the first means of controlling other governments uh, is to get them into debt, uh, oblige them to uh, bow, uh, support their exchange rate by bar uh, borrowing from the International Monetary Fund and from the World Bank that insists that, yes, we will give you uh, credit to balance your currency as you deindustrialize, but you're going to have to uh, sell your uh, public domains Uh, from the government sector into private borrowers. You're going to have to privatize uh, your economies so that your economy is going to look like the British economy looked uh, at the hands of Margaret Thatcher and then Tony Blair and the Labour parties. And the irony is that the United States, fearing socialism and fearing a Labour party, has concentrated its regime change on taking over the social democratic parties of Europe, and taking over the Labour parties of Europe. So you have the Labour Party of England being on the right wing of the political spectrum. 
just as the Democratic Party in the United States is on the right wing of the political spectrum now. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the blue collar industrial labor force is supporting the Republicans instead of the Democrats. Same thing uh, throughout Europe. And the idea is uh, the aim of American interference in European politics from Italy to Northern Europe is to prevent uh, any alternative to finance capitalism from uh, even being on the ballot, such as uh, uh, the, the right-wing uh, uh, pol uh, policies in, uh, uh, in Europe uh, that are trying to resist this Europeanization, which is really an attempt to make Europe a, uh, as much of an economic colony of the United States as uh, Latin America has been made uh, in uh, economic colony. Let, let, let's see this uh, relation between the US and Europe from a, a slightly different point of view that is connected to, to what you have said uh, now. I mean, uh, uh, looking at the behavior of the countries of the European Union, and in particular in Germany, as you already anticipated in recent years, one is like disconcerted, no? it almost seems like there is uh, some masochism, no? like uh, characterized by political initiatives that only accelerate the continent's decline, right? And then one looks at the data, data uh, uh, on the shares of global wealth held by various countries, and it turns out that in the last 15 years, uh, in particular since the Greek crisis of 2007-2008, uh, the relative wealth of Europe, of Europe, European countries, has plummeted. While that of the US, despite the rise of emerging countries, uh, has remained stable. No? That, that, that means, in absolute terms, it means that has grown enormously. No? In short, so enormous shares of wealth have moved from the old continent to the US. No? And we have defined this, the, this process as the greatest theft in human history, maybe. No? And looking at the data, it seems that shortly before uh, the exact same thing had happened also between the US and Japan. No? Like in the 80s, uh, the GDP per capita in Japan was almost the same than the US, now is uh, less than half of the US. No? Uh, uh, I mean, what is the relationship? between the willingness of the U.S. allies, the Europe now and Japan before, to fully align with the U.S. geopolitical agenda, you know, and despite the burden it places on their own economy, and this gigantic theft. I mean, why are we so masochistic? Where is the structure of these things that look so masochistic in, uh, in the surface? Well, what you've described is where the materialist approach to history seems to break down. Uh, the materialist uh, approach to history uh, believes that uh, every ultimately countries will act in their self-interest. That's the only way that you can really look at how is the world going to evolve. Uh, and when uh, Marx looked at uh, industrial capitalism, he said, well, the interest of industrial capitalism is to lower the cost of uh, doing uh, business and uh, by getting rid of the uh, rentier class, getting rid of the landlord class, the monopoly class, and uh, getting rid of usury banking and making it a uh, public banking. And uh, uh, countries that do not do this, countries that do not socialize are going to fall behind and leading the socialist countries to uh, become so successful that they will spread their uh, philosophy of, uh, of production and of their economic principles uh, to the less productive economies. And so you're going to have the most productive economies uh, winning the evolution uh, because of the survival of the fittest principle. And uh, that's how the world is going to end up socialist. Well, the world so far is, uh, is not ending up socialist, or at least it hasn't uh, been uh, uh, even uh, moving towards socialism for the last century. Uh, for the first time now, there is an alternative uh, to uh, this uh, self-destructive uh, uh, finance capitalism 
by uh, resuming, all of a sudden, a country is acting in its self-interest. China is not acting like Japan. If China would have acted like Japan, it would have let American banks uh, simply uh, create uh, credit on a computer and go out and let, say, well, we're going to buy China's uh, auto industry. We're going to buy China's uh, real estate companies. We're going to buy Chinese banks. Uh, and we're going to be able to buy China's economy and turn it into uh, a, an economy that either it gives all of the income that it earns to the American investors who bought out its companies, or uh, we will uh, impose uh, sanctions and isolate China like uh, we threatened to do Japan. Uh, and uh, the United States basically in uh, 1985 and in in six in the Plaza Accords, the United States asked, asked Japan to commit economic suicide. And there was a split uh, in Japan. Uh, when I went there in uh, the 1970s, around 1974, uh, I met with uh, the heads of uh, Nippon Steel, for instance. And uh, the uh, uh, Nippon Steel was very much uh, saying, well, we want the United States as a market. We're going to do whatever the United States uh, wants us to do in order to, uh, uh, for the United States to let us uh, get rich by exporting our steel to the United States. Well, there was, uh, his assistant took me aside and said he was the number two man at U.S. Steel. And uh, uh, his job was in case Japan wanted to turn towards China instead of the United States, he was going to uh, try to prepare the links out to go to China. Well, obviously, uh, when uh, Japan uh, seemed to be uh, the most productive eco uh, industrial economy in the world in the mid-1980s, the United States uh, asked uh, uh, Japan to uh, raise its interest rates to make itself less competitive. Uh, it, it told Japan, well, you're making up your, all these U.S. dollars, but you cannot do what we Americans do. You cannot use these dollars that you're getting as a result of your steel and other exports. Uh, you can't use them to buy American companies. You can buy American real estate. And Japan lost its shirt on buying Amer prestige real estate like golf courses, and Rockefeller Center. It didn't understand how American financial capitalism worked. Uh, and indeed, the bank seemed to getting rich as its uh, housing crisis went up. Uh, all Japan's wealth, all this money that Japan was making was uh, basically plowed into Japanese real estate that rose into such a bubble that uh, the uh, land around the royal palace uh, the, uh, in uh, Japan was worth more than the entire state of California. And the result of America, the Plaza Accord, uh, followed by the Louvre Accord, uh, was uh, the, a, a, a collapse of the bubble economy uh, that Japan had fostered. And uh, basically, it ended uh, the whole Japan industrial dominance. China sees this. It doesn't want to do this. It, it says, we don't need uh, American dollars to create the credit to build our housing, to build our factories, to employ labor, to create uh, high-speed railroads, to create public transportation, to provide health, public health, we can uh, create our money itself. And when the Bank of uh, uh, People's Bank of China creates money, it's for actual uh, industrial purposes. It's doing what uh, America. Uh, and what Marx expected uh, industrial capitalism to evolve into. Uh, it's uh, basically, it wants to it's raise the quality of Chinese labor by giving it better housing, better education, better health, better uh, support uh, all, all along, so that Chinese labor has become much more productive than a foreign labor. And that's created a model that uh, other Asian countries uh, are adopting. And so the United States sees it, uh, itself saying, well, what have we done? By trying to make money financially instead of industrially, we've led, uh, we've led the other world to, uh, part of the world, to essentially concentrate all the productivity in its own hands. 
how are we Americans going to dominate the world and get all of the economic surplus of other countries if uh, we don't uh, have our own industrial exports and we don't even have an army uh, to invade? How can we control other countries in the way that uh, the West for the last thousand years have controlled countries, both by an army, uh, by military threat, and by uh, by uh, in industrializing and uh, an ex a trade and balance of payment surplus? We're right. We Americans are running a balance of payment deficit for uh, all the 800 plus military bases that we have in the rest of the world. How can we make other countries pay? for these military bases that are surrounding them, how can we make them pay the dollar debts and use our dollars as their own savings? How do we prevent them from using their own productivity and their own money uh, for their own savings and to have an economy uh, to reach out, to integrate with other economies in mutual aid, mutual support, uh, where they're growing, leaving us not to grow? That's the, uh, the whole dilemma. That is, uh, I think, that you've uh, talked about, uh, because you now are having uh, the Eurasian countries with the Global South acting in their own interests, uh, whereas the United States, it turns out, has not acted in its own interest. Uh, it, it, it's acted in the interest of a narrow financial class that has taken over uh, uh, the Western economies, leaving America and Europe, the NATO economies, uh, what uh, the head of Europe, uh, Borrell, calls the garden, uh, as opposed to the jungle. Well, the jungle's growing. Uh, the garden is, is wilting. Uh, that's uh, basically uh, the problem that you're having today. It's like the world is picking up uh, today where it le left off on the eve of World War I. That's uh, the basic dynamic. And uh, you're having the aim of these uh, Eurasian countries to bring prices in line with the actual cost value, without a landlord class, without an independent monopoly class, uh, without privatized monopolies, without following Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, uh, and uh, with, without a private uh, banking class. Uh, that's basically the, the world split that I described. And, but, but it looks like no, these oligarchies you, you mentioned in the West, no? like they are like a transnational class, but then the asset they are mainly in the US. So you have the oligarchies uh, in Europe that extract what they can still extract from the real economy. We have seen in the last two years, for example, extra profit in a, in a lot of fields. No, In the last days, we had the, the figures of the extra profit in 2023 of the main bank uh, in Italy, the main two banks, they all went in, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, dividends, you say dividends, uh, to the shareholders, and uh, not investment at all, and they all will go through fiscal heaven, tax heaven, so no tax, and then uh, through uh, f uh, wealth managers and, and stuff like this, to the uh, asset bubble in the U.S. So is the, 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 tra the transfer of the wealth, European wealth to the U.S., it works like this, no? extracting the, what uh, you can still extract from the real economy through the tax havens going in the asset bubble in the U.S. So you have this, like, it's a transnational class, but it's geographically localized in the U.S., so it's, uh, uh, I mean, it, it is that w what we see w when we see our e economic elite selling the future of Europe is because they they earn much more money with, in this, in this, uh, with this mechanism than not investing and making profit through the real economy. Uh, it works like this. Well, you use the word earn money. Uh, and uh, in the classical terminology, they don't earn the money. The, the money they make is unearned income. That's economic rent. Landlord rent is unearned income. Financial speculation is unearned income. Labor earns wages. Industrial capitalists earn profits. But nobody earns rent. 
as uh, uh, I said, uh, according John Stuart Mill, they, they uh, get dividends and interest payments and rents in their sleep. They don't do anything to earn it, so there's no value uh, that is being created by their activity. And if you don't create value, you don't earn income. So when you talk about the Western bubble economy, quite correctly, the uh, bubbles uh, uh, does create wealth for uh, the uh, rentier sector, but this wealth is unearned income, uh, and it's not a democracy. And uh, uh, when you talk about uh, Europe and America, uh, uh, what is the aim of democracy? The aim of democracy is rising living standards and productivity. And uh, the way to make living in, uh, standards rise is to keep down the cost of living by keeping down the cost of housing, by not letting uh, uh, landlords uh, collect uh, uh, the, the rent, but uh, the, the state is the landowner. Uh, it requires blocking financialization, blocking privatization. Uh, and uh, in Europe and America, uh, uh, there's a kind of irony. China sends its economic students to the United States to study economics because thinking the United States has so many rich people, they must have got rich by earning their income. But they don't earn the income. And when their students study economics, they're taught that there's no such thing as uh, uh, unearned income. Uh, and uh, the way to get rich quickly is uh, financially. Uh, but getting rich financially means deindustrializing the economy. That's the irony. Uh, how do you earn money by not creating a value, by deindustrializing the economy, uh, and uh, by essentially uh, preventing labor from uh, earning more wages and uh, living better, uh, but keeping it all for yourself to make uh, more money financially that you use your, what do you do with the interest payments and the capital gains you make? You buy, uh, you make more loans and load the economy even more down with debt. And so the economic model is, as you just said, a bubble economy. So you have the West in a financial bubble uh, using a word that was very popular in the 19th century, fictitious capital. That was a word used not only by Marx, but by uh, other uh, socialists and other people. So uh, the Western economies are fictitious capital uh, economies, bubble economies, uh, and you do have a very wealthy ten uh, percent, but you don't have, but you uh, you don't have the ninety percent. You don't have the industrial labor force getting richer. The industrial labor has seen its real wages go down uh, for the last uh, twenty years, and especially since the two thousand eight financial crisis. Uh, there's been a uh, a sort of slow. Uh, debt deflation, a slow depression uh, in the United States and in Europe uh, uh, that's now accelerating rapidly. Uh, and as it's uh, accelerating rapidly, you're having the dominance of Eurasia stepping up. And that's why uh, the uh, U.S. reaction has been so military and so violent, trying to say we're about to lose our, uh, our alternative to socialism if we don't uh, act militarily. And, but, but I mean, this, um, you mean, yeah, uh, the, the main uh, way to make money today is, is through the mm, asset bubble, no? And the main asset bubble are bubbles because they are the, the real estate, the commercial real estate, uh, the market, the, 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 the uh, how do you say, the share, the share market, uh, the bonds, all the financial products, every the everything bubble no as we call it and i mean it was also the way how uh, the us co-opted no the like the the economical elites also from the south no like in uh, also like i i don't know like in thailand they make money producing and then the money they have they bring it through tax havens so no taxation so the state has no money to invest to develop in the uh, standard and pool 500s or nasdaq or the real estate in the us no like and so this has been the mechanism through which the us has 
like divide et impera the south, the global south, no? Like co-opting the economical elite in this way. I, is this the, the things that we see like uh, a much more coordinated uh, global south with all the difficulties and differences, but a much more coordinated global south compared in the past? It means that this mechanism is not working anymore. Uh, I mean, w what happened to this mechanism of cooptation of the econom economical elites of the global south? Well, the main way in which the United States is trying to control the global south is uh, financially. It uses military uh, mainly to back up its financial control. And if the global south uh, has been advised by the World Bank and the IMF not to compete with America, but uh, to follow a self-destructive uh, economic policy of uh, depending on America for its food grains, not to feed itself. Uh, the World Bank has not uh, tried to help countries fe feed themselves with their own food. They ha uh, they've relied on U.S. agriculture, which has become uh, a main e uh, export uh, good. And the United States has controlled uh, oil. the world oil trade is a key to its imperialism. So between agriculture, food, uh, and oil, uh, it tried to force the global south into debt. And once the global south is forced into debt, the IMF comes in and said, well, uh, we are going to uh, l lend you money to avoid depreciation by, uh, uh, so you'll raise the money to pay the debt by selling off your public utilities, sell off your land, sell off your mineral rights, sell off your oil rights, uh, sell off uh, everything that the government owns uh, to uh, the foreigners so that you'll have the money to pay the foreigners the debt that uh, you owe them. Well, right now, uh, with, uh, with oil prices going up, with food prices going up, with the sanctions that the United States has convinced uh, its client dictatorships to impose on Russia, uh, uh, Russian oil and uh, agriculture and fertilizer, which is made out of Russian gas largely, uh, you're, you're all of a sudden having the global south countries uh, unable to balance their international payments if they repay all of the uh, dollar debts that they've run into as a result of following the destructive economic policies imposed by the IMF and the World Bank ever since 1945. The only way that the Global South can join the alternative to finance capitalism and avoid being a victim uh, is to say, well, uh, this financial debt is the new version, the American a version of neocolonialism. Instead of military colonialism, America has imposed financial colonialism on the global south. And just as you're seeing in Central Africa, they're breaking away from the French colonialism uh, that required them to use French banks and French monopolies and uh, everything uh, French. Uh, you're having them uh, follow the logical uh, alternative of saying, well, uh, not only are we going to throw out the old European colonial powers, but the post-European American financial colonial powers. Uh, if they're going to go towards socialism and follow uh, the model of uh, economic development that is in their own self-interest, they've got to uh, make a break uh, from the American dollarized system. They've got to de-dollarize their economy by essentially saying we're not going to pay the foreign debts any more than uh, uh, we're going to pay for uh, uh, military colonialism. The Global South now is uh, in the same position that Haiti was in at the beginning of the 19th century when it had to pay for its uh, nominal political independence by paying uh, France for all of the slaves that were freed. Uh, well, uh, the Global South today is not going to follow that rule. And uh, the United States said, well, if you're not going to pay the dollar debts, then we're going to treat you like we're treating Russia and China. We're going to block you off from uh, the U.S. and European economies. And the Global South can say, well, 
what on earth is uh, the United States and uh, Europe uh, really doing to help us? We don't need the United States and Europe. We now have an alternative. Well, way back in 1954, the Global South countries began to discuss this uh, in, uh, uh, in Indonesia uh, under Sukarno with uh, the whole hopes for uh, an, uh, an alternative economy. But the Global South didn't have uh, a critical mass at that time. When Cuba had its revolution and the United States tried to isolate it, Cuba didn't really have much of an alternative. Uh, and the United States has tried to prevent any Latin American country, any African country, even any uh, South Asian country from providing an alternative. But for the first time now, China, Russia, Iran, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, basically, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative countries have an alternative. And uh, it's an alternative that uh, the United States actually didn't even anticipate. Uh, it, it didn't understand how its own financial capitalism was undermining its, the industrial capitalism that had made America and Europe wealthy in the first place. Uh, so uh, you're all of a sudden having uh, the uh, Eurasian countries uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, I don't think the Eurasian countries have framed what they're trying to do as an alternative by studying uh, the 19th century, but the problem that the global south has today is exactly the problem that European countries had in the 19th century, and uh, uh, the problem that the classical economists, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx is the uh, culmination of classical economics, uh, and uh, their socialist successors were all trying uh, to develop. Uh, this wheel is being reinvented today uh, on basically a pragmatic uh, basis and uh, uh, pragmatically alone is leading to the same solution today that uh, was all thought out in much greater detail in terms of value, price, and rent theory uh, in the 19th century, which is why I'm trying to urge classical economics uh, as uh, a guide to uh, the alternative to post classical economics, to Rontier cla classical economics, to neoliberalism. Uh, and uh, basically the neoliberal junk economics that uh, dominates the West. Great. Sorry, Michael, uh, one thing in this great explanation you have made, I don't understand exactly what's the role of capital flights, that is central, and of tax havens that, I mean, uh, they facilitate the capital flights uh, and on the other hand, uh, uh, also don't allow the countries where the capital comes from to have some money to push the, the, the development locally at all. What are the, the, what's the central role of capital flights and tax seven in all these macro explanations? Well, I've discussed this in a number of uh, articles, for instance, in Finance Capitalism and Its Discontent. Capital flight really began with the oil industry and the mining industry in the 19th centuries. Uh, in 1913, uh, just before World War I began, you had the United States introduce an income tax. And the income tax only fell on uh, the wealthiest 1 or 2% of the population. It fell on the landlords and on the banks and on wealthy people and on the oil industry. Uh, you had uh, the wealthiest class in the United States being the oil industry, uh, because that was private uh, capital. Not uh, uh, they, uh, the, Unlike uh, uh, most countries historically, the United States did not keep mineral wealth in the public domain. It led uh, mineral oil wealth be uh, privatized. So you had the uh, American oil majors, uh, the British uh, oil companies, uh, the French oil companies, all dominating uh, 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 the world trade in oil, their question was, how do we avoid paying an income tax? And uh, their uh, uh, alternative was to create flags of convenience uh, in uh, Liberia and Panama were not real countries. Uh, a real country would have its own currency and would have its own tax system, but Liberia and Panama didn't have an income tax uh, and uh, it didn't have 
a currency risk. So uh, when the United States oil company would say, make money in Aramco, in, in Saudi Arabia, or in uh, uh, the other Arab countries, or uh, Iran, or the Near East, or Africa, they would uh, sell their oil at a very uh, low price uh, to a trading company that was incorporated in a flag of convenience in Liberia or Panama. This uh, trading company would then turn around and sell uh, the same oil at a very large price to refineries in the United States and in Europe. So the refineries didn't really make uh, a profit because they had to pay for a uh, large uh, uh, price for the oil. Uh, and when I was asked in 1995 to uh, make us by the oil uh, uh, industry through Chase Manhattan to uh, study the balance of payments of the oil industry, uh, I, I went to the uh, treasurer's office at Standard Oil of New Jersey in Rockefeller Center, named after the creator of Standard Oil, and said, I, where are the profit made? Do you make the profits at the producing end uh, uh, or at the consuming end? And uh, the treasurer told me, oh, yeah. I make the profits right here in my office. I decide where to make the profits. And uh, we make all our profits in Liberia and uh, Panama uh, because uh, we uh, uh, buy cheaply, we sell high, but uh, we don't have to pay any income tax. And because of our uh, international treaties of uh, uh, being able to have any country follow the tax rules of the country where uh, it operates, uh, it's as if Standard Oil made all its money in Liberia and Panama, even though neither country produced any oil of its own. So uh, uh, the, the, the mining countries companies did exactly the same thing. They would uh, pay the uh, raw materials producers very low prices for their uh, uh, whatever metal uh, or other product they were mining. They would sell them at high prices. Uh, to the refineries and to the consumers in America and Europe, and all this was done tax-free. Well, uh, this was the model that uh, was used by the State Department and uh, uh, in, uh, as the Vietnam War pushed the United States into balance of payments deficit. Uh, some, uh, a former State Department official uh, who had joined the uh, Chase Manhattan Bank said, uh, we're trying to figure out how to finance the Vietnam War and all of our balance of payments deficit. And uh, we think the way to become a, uh, to finance it is to uh, make America the new Switzerland. We want to make America the home of the world's criminals. We, uh, we class because crime pays, drug dealing pays. We want the drug dealers to keep all their savings in dollars. That will help finance the uh, Vietnam War and our other military spending in Southeast Asia. Uh, we want uh, the dictators of the world, uh, the uh, African dictators, the Latin Americans, to keep their wealth, to take their wealth out of their country and to uh, 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 keep it in American banks. Well, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to uh, create uh, flags of convenience, not only in Panama and Liberia, but uh, throughout uh, the Caribbean countries. And uh, we're going to ask Chase Manhattan and Citibank and other banks to open branches in these offshore uh, banking centers, which are really uh, tax avoidance centers. And if they can put their money safely in uh, uh, the, the West Indies, uh, various uh, places there, uh, and uh, other uh, sort of uh, American uh, uh, bank tax avoidance centers, then these branches will uh, accept the money from African dictators, Latin American dictators, Colombian drug dealers, uh, and they will then send this uh, money from the branches to the uh, head offices in the United States. And of course, London became an offshore banking center too, uh, with the euro dollar market. So uh, the United States uh, convinced uh, the world's uh, criminal class uh, and the financial class the financial class merged with the criminal class because uh, if you have criminals wanting to keep their money liquid, they want to financialize the wealth. 
that where are they going to keep all uh, all these uh, uh, $100 bills of uh, currency that they get for selling their drugs? Well, they're going to want to keep it safely in the bank. And so the United States financed its military spending in Vietnam and other countries by replacing Switzerland and uh, becoming uh, the uh, uh, basically the uh, uh, the saving center for the world's criminal class. And of course, uh, soon uh, not only the criminals realized that they could avoid uh, paying taxes by uh, using these offshore banking centers, but the financial class, the industrial class, the financial class, honest people thought, well, wait a minute, if we have an affiliate in the Dutch West Indies, we can pretend that the affiliate is uh, uh, lending money to us. And so if you're an industrial company and uh, uh, let's say you're a mining company and you go into a country like Iceland and say, we want to use uh, uh, your uh, volcanic and uh, uh, heat to produce electricity to make aluminum. We want to make an aluminum country. We'll share the profits with you. But uh, we will lend the aluminum uh, affiliate. Uh, we will create, an, uh, uh, we in the head office will uh, create money through, uh, we'll put it in our offshore banking center in the Caribbean or in England or somewhere. And uh, we will lend so much money to the uh, mining and uh, uh, aluminum affiliate in Iceland that will seem not to make a profit. So if you look at the oil industry throughout the whole world, this is where uh, the most wealthiest industry in the world, it doesn't seem to earn any profits at all. Just like real estate doesn't earn profits. If you're a real estate person, you will uh, make your wealth, you'll create an offshore uh, real estate company that will uh, essentially, all the profits, you, uh, the rents you make, you will put in this offshore Panamanian uh, uh just pretend corporation, the Panamanian corporation will lend you the money. So all of your uh, rents uh, you'll pay as interest to yourself through your Panamanian uh, uh, affiliate. So you have fictitious accounting uh, is creating fictitious capital uh, uh, through a fictitious uh, uh, pseudo country like Panama or uh, the Dutch West Indies uh, in the Caribbean or uh, wherever they want, uh, Liberia, or uh, wherever they want to create these uh, fictitious countries, making fictitious capital using fictitious accounting. And uh, that's how the whole Western and uh, post-industrial economy is, is operating tax-free. The purpose of these offshore uh, banking centers is to save uh, property owners and monopolists and the oil industry and the mining industry and the drug trade from having to pay uh, uh, income tax. That's great. And, and uh, I mean, but, but uh, as you say, no, the, this mechanism make the US very weak from an industrial point of view, but, uh, and uh, it only benefit a, a tiny uh, oligarchy. But I mean, from this point of view, about a year ago, we, but also the mainstream media, we're talking about a possible recession, no, in the U.S. The recession instead arrived in Germany, no, maybe, uh, and uh, and the stagnation in all the rest of the continent. Why they, while the U.S. recorded consistent growth, no, despite the Fed's restrictive restrictive monetary policies. Why? And I mean, and, and is this the terminal phase of the great theft we have witnessed over the last 15 years? And uh, I mean, uh, on what is based? Can, can we talk about a war fought with, uh, I mean, what's the role of neoprotectionist measures in this, like uh, oh, the IRA and so And if so, why do Europe, uh, Europe and other US allies continue to accept it? I mean, this is not just uh, having uh, 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 the uh, asset bubble paradise where we can take our money and make money without doing nothing, just rentier money and uh, it's a direct uh, attack of the u.s industry against the uh, the european industry through protectionist measures and public incentives paid by debt that is just possible because you have the 
dollar system, no? I mean, why we still continue to accept this? Well, the one book of mine that has been translated into Italian is Killing the Host. Uh, and that explains uh, that America has been in uh, a recession since two, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. It's been in the Obama Depression. And the Obama Depression is basically a debt deflation. Uh, and uh, since 2008, you've had uh, real wages and industrial investment slowly declining. You've had a huge increase in rentier income, a huge increase in debt, a huge increase in debt, uh, in debt service, uh, interest and amortization, a huge increase in uh, rents, uh, a decrease in home ownership. Uh, and a shift into landlord absentee ownership in the United States, a huge transfer of uh, industrial capital out of the hands of industrial companies into uh, in, uh, increasingly debt finance. And if a, an industrial company doesn't uh, run into debt itself for production, uh, it will artificially run into debt just to prevent a corporate raider from taking it over by borrowing money and turning its profits into interest rates. So uh, you, you've had uh, the American economy shrinking since 2008, but the illusion of growing. For instance, interest payments are added to GDP. Rents are added to GDP as if landlords create a surplus, a uh, economic surplus. And uh, in America, for instance, right now, you're having uh, uh, labor uh, and industry uh, fall further behind in its debt service. So uh, you have uh, 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 credit card holders, for instance, when they can't afford to keep up with their credit card payments, uh, they are their interest rates go up from 19% to over 30%. Well, in the GDP, uh, this uh, penalty rate, uh, this added 30% is called providing a financial service, and that's added to GDP. So uh, what is, uh, you're, you're creating a fictitious uh, product, uh, uh, charging a penalty rate of interest when you're, uh, you've made a bad loan and your uh, creditor, your debtors cannot pay you. The bad loan is uh, counted as creating a product. Uh, charging more for rent is a product. As uh, If you're a homeowner, uh, you're, uh, a number of homeowners are asked uh, every quarter, uh, suppose you had to pay uh, for uh, the house that uh, you own. What if you actually had to pay rent for this? What would the rental value, uh, the rental charge, I won't say rental value, because rent is not value. What will, would the rent be for uh, having to uh, pay for what you now own? Well, they'll say, oh, now the rent's gone way up. That's the fastest growing uh, uh, price in the United States. Uh, we'd now have to pay uh, in New York. They have to pay forty-five hundred dollars a month is the average rent in the in New York City. Well, even if they bought the house uh, years ago for uh, uh, when rents would only be let's say uh, fifteen hundred dollars a month, all that increase in rent is counted as an increase in uh, national income in GDP. So what you have is fictitious GDP uh, in the United States and in countries that are following the kind of national income accounting that uh, the United States has convinced uh, the uh, United Nations uh, to follow. Well, uh, obviously, if you're China, you say, well, you know, we want to know how fast our economy is growing. Uh, do we want to increase, count the increase in the cost of living is a product or is it overhead? The uh, post-classical economics confuses wealth in overhead. And what people consider wealth today, getting rich by having a big bank account that's backed by holding the rest of the economy in debt, uh, that is counted as a wealth cr uh, creation, not a bubble economy. But it's actually a bubble economy. It's a debt-ridden de economy falling into deepening debt deflation in the United States, just like the Global South debt deflation that I described in your earlier question. Uh, so you're having a debt-ridden American and European economy 
pretending that it's growing because the growth in debt is counted as GDP, as national income uh, for the rentier class. It doesn't say economic rent is a form of economic overhead produced by the industrial uh, capital uh, and labor. It's a, an added burden that has to carry. Instead of trading uh, 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 debt service and monopoly payments uh, and uh, uh, the debt overhead as uh, a burden, it's treated as, as if it's economic growth itself. It's as if you're carrying a tumor on the body and you're thinking, well, I'm getting heavier and heavier because of this tumor I'm carrying. Uh, I guess the economy is uh, growing just like that. It's getting heavier and heavier. Well, it's getting heavier, but uh, it's not getting more productive. The tumor is sucking all of the life out of the body itself until finally it, uh, it, it dies. I mean, from the, you, you mentioned the, uh, the, the East Asian deflation. I mean, there is a lot of polemics around the Chinese deflation right now. And, uh, co and together with the uh, real estate uh, crisis uh, in China. How do you see, I mean, uh, what's the cause of these two phenomena? How do you see the reaction of China? And I mean, uh, uh, what's the general condition of economy of China uh, in front of these two big phenomena of deflation and real estate crisis? Well, China got rich um, in, by having a mixed economy. Uh, it, already in the 1970s, it said we don't want to follow the Russian uh, Stalinist mode of uh, central planning. Uh, we know that the Chinese uh, are very entrepreneurial people. Let's let a hundred flowers bloom. They actually brought Milton Friedman over from the University of Chicago to uh, advise. And he said, uh, you can't really plan the whole economy. There's going to be innovation. Let there be innovators. Let, let the innovators make money. Once they make money, you can decide whether you want to tax them or not or what you want to do. So uh, they let Jack Ma come in and uh, uh, make a lot of money. And then when he became a super billionaire, they said, well, re this money, you really have to contribute to the state. Well, there's uh, uh, Milton Friedman uh, and the uh, Chinese Research Institute was based in Shanghai. Uh, and you always had Shanghai is basically being a center for promoting neoliberal monetary economics. And then you had Beijing as the political center. And uh, already, I think, 10 or 12 years ago, uh, when I was lecturing in uh, Beijing, uh, my students would come to me and say, uh, you know, we, we really look like we can, uh, China is making its own growth. We're so optimistic. We can play a role in this. Uh, well, there's a lot of uh, corruption. Neoliberalism is corruption. Neoliberalism and taking money out of the public domain and privatizing it is corruption. And yet, throughout history, for the last few thousand years, most family fortunes have been made by privatizing the public domain. And it's very much uh, like Balzac said, behind every family fortune is a great theft, and the theft is usually from the public domain, but it's so long ago that it's all woven into history and nobody even remembers that it began is a, uh, an insider dealing. Uh, often by military conquest, privatizing the public domain. Well, China said, we don't want to have uh, this uh, uh, privatization, this enterprise creating uh, just a, the kind of a, a landlord class, a, a monopoly class, a 1% uh, class like you have uh, in the West. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, they, uh, they're just now coping with the fact that uh, they... Uh, they have been since the ninth, since really the Mao's revolution. For, th for 40 years now, China has been a decentralized economy. It, it's let the local uh, localities follow their own means of growth. Well, one of the problems of this is that uh, local cities and towns have uh, grown. Essentially, how do they make money to provide their own public services? Well, they've made their money by uh, selling off land to uh, developers to 
develop real estate. R renting, not selling, because the, the ownership remains to the local uh, government, right? Right. It, right, but there hasn't really been a tax system for this back, and so they've created uh, a, 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 a... They've turned the land over to the developers, and the, the developers have then gone to uh, the banks to borrow money to build the buildings and uh, like uh, uh, to build all these huge buildings that you've seen, often uh, empty buildings. They, they would build the building first and uh, uh, we expect the population to follow. That's how uh, the, the great uh, uh, Chinese uh, real estate companies developed. And now all of a sudden uh, they find themselves uh, that they've overbuilt uh, and they're not able to pay the debts that they've taken on. So China says, uh, well, these debts are ultimately owned to uh, the banks, and the banks have guaranteed these debts. What do we do? Uh, if uh, if uh, the big Chinese real estate companies cannot pay the banks, then the banks are in trouble. Uh, does China let these uh, local private banks that have borrowed from the Bank of China, that have uh, uh, lent money to uh, private banks to decide you know, where to lend out. These private banks have made bank loans. They're insolvent, just like Citicorp. And Citibank was insolvent in 2008 when the junk mortgage crisis uh, broke in the United States. Well, uh, the, the banks have uh, lent the money and uh, China had begun to sell promises to build a housing that is now unfinished. So what is China going to do? Uh, if it uh, doesn't uh, let uh, it, uh, uh, wipe out uh, this fictitious capital debt to the banks, then uh, the banks won't have the money to enable these apartments to be finished. China wants the apartments to be finished so that the families that have made down payments in order to buy the uh, property will be able to get uh, the property, but it can't uh, uh, let this occur without letting uh, the banks that have made the bad loans go under. And what will it do if the banks go under? Well, China decides, well, the banks have two classes of depositors, just like America uh, and Europe. It, you have uh, the bulk of depositors are wage earners that have put their savings in. We, want, we don't want them to lose the money. We want to make sure that the, uh, the Chinese uh, nor people, the working class, the wage earners, don't earn the, mon owe the money. But if the banks uh, made a bad loan, then the big depositors are going to lose the money. And uh, we in the uh, Beijing government uh, and the party leadership want to promote the population at large. We don't want to protect the billionaires who made uh, the deposit. So somebody has to lose when the debts can't be paid. And uh, the question that China is facing now is who's going to lose? Will it be the big depositors in the bank instead of the small depositors? Uh, will it be the uh, foreign creditors of, uh, uh, of uh, the real estate companies? Obviously, uh, they would not mind if uh, the stockholders of the, uh, the big real estate companies lose money. Well, they made a bad investment. That's what happens when you make a bad investment. You lose the money. So China doesn't want to have to pay them. Uh, and the, uh, if, the, if the banks have guaranteed the loans, then China has to let the banks go under. So these stockholders uh, and uh, creditors will be wiped out, not the innocent buyers uh, who actually the apartments have been built for. Uh, the whole purpose of building real estate is for people to live in. And as President Xi said, uh, housing should be for living in, not as an investment vehicle. So now China is finally dealing with the fact that uh, there's been an absentee-owned investment class uh, uh, in, for its real estate, and it's finally deciding we're not going to follow the American neoliberal financialization path. We're going to follow the socialist path, and uh, that's what's being worked out in the discussions that are occurring in China today. But uh, uh, Michael, don't, don't you think that the, the crisis, the, the, the real estate crisis in China uh, from another point of view is quite different from the one where we have seen in the West because it's like a, a more uh, traditional industrial oversupply crisis? Yes. Yes. 
is an oversupply crisis without the banks controlling the government, as occurs in the United States. Uh, instead of the banks controlling the government, you still have the Communist Party controlling the government, acting in uh, the public interest. And so we're back to the question is, what kind of democracy are you going to have? Uh, American democracy is really an oligarchy. And it's an oligarchy controlled by uh, the banking class, by the financial class. Uh, China is a democracy controlled by a central government uh, governing the economy to act in the public interest, the interest of its majority of uh, uh, citizens who are wage earners. That's the difference between China, uh, China's model and uh, the Western model. It's the difference between uh, a, a real democracy requiring a central government uh, prevention of a financial oligarchy and the United States, uh, which is a transition uh, uh, to a, an increasingly centralized financial oligarchy. I have one last question, then, I, then we hear from Alessandro if we have something more. I mean, faced with the fact that as Ottolina TV, we have always uh, welcomed every sign of decline of the US empire. No? And often the criticism made is that the future world will simply have another master, no? China, and it will be no, not better. No? Uh, Ray Dalio and other so-called realists no? always talk about the end of the cycle of world capitalism, which showed the United States at the center and the beginning of a new cycle with China at the center, no? following the pattern of the history of global capitalism uh, as a succession of uh, different centers of capitalist accumulation as derived from uh, Brodel mainly. No? Uh, what do you think? W will we simply pass from one master to another or will the international order of the future be completely different. I mean, there will be a, 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 a global system without a center. This is the question that's been discussed most publicly by President Putin in his press conferences and speeches and by Secretary, uh, Foreign Secretary Lavrov. Uh, they make it very clear uh, that uh, the only way in which the American empire can be replaced is by a different kind of a world order a multipolar world order, and only a multipolar world order is able to uh, actually grow uh, and prevent the kind of concentrated imperialism that you have in the kind of financialized, unipolar, dollarized order that uh, the United States uh, is, is uh, creating. So uh, a multipolar order is not going to have one currency that is uh, issued by uh, a dominant country to concentrate all the other countries' uh, economic surplus uh, in the hands of the, uh, the dominant imperial country. If that's the case, other countries would break away. That's why Russia, China, Iran are the first countries to lead the breakaway uh, and by creating an alliance with the global south, with uh, Central Asian countries, uh, with the whole rest of Eurasia, Uh, leaving uh, the United States and NATO uh, uh, isolated and not part of the order because it's uh, uh, a U.S.-centered order. The only way that you can create an alternative that's going to grow is to have a multipolar order that is avoiding the taproot of imperialism. Uh, and the taproot of imperialism is a combination of military spending, and, which is an overhead cost, and financial control by uh, debt uh, uh, and financial control uh, that also is a form of economic overhead. Uh, and any kind of an empire ends up as an economic overhead, a military overhead and a financial overhead. Uh, is, uh, uh, the financial colonialism is, uh, goes hand in hand uh, with the military post-colonial uh, world. And uh, if other countries are to grow, they have to, uh, uh, The way to grow is to avoid having the whole idea of a, uh, an imperial center sucking out the wealth of other countries. So if this alternative to uh, financialization and military imperialism is built into the new world order, 
to enable it to break free of the U.S. NATO uh, imperial order, then uh, you have to create this alternative by picking up the uh, world economy along the lines that it seemed to be evolving into socialism at the end of the 19th century and the early 20th century. So we're finally seeing uh, basically a, a civilizational choice. Uh, civilization began to roll backwards in World War I and even more and more backward under American imperialism. The rest of the world order is saying we're going to pick up the progress that seemed to be developing in the late 19th century, the progress towards socialism. So this uh, new world order, instead of uh, colonialism, it's going towards socialism. And we're back with what Rosa Luxemburg said. Either you have colonialism or barbarism. And that's what the, uh, uh, the uh, Eurasian world order is juxtaposing to the dollarized uh, US NATO world order. Socialism, not barbarism. Now, I, I forgot one thing that is quite important, no? because like you said, no, uh, the bubble economy, no? like uh, the, the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. No? The, the Western econo economy is the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. And it looks like starting from the, uh, the, the, the financial crisis in 2008, uh, as Vijay Prashad called it the first great reparation of global capitalism. No? And, uh, and we have built, the West has, and the US has built this huge financial mono monopoly that are mainly the, the huge uh, asset management fund, no? like BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street, that have so much, so much liquidity that they looks like they can uh, keep inflating the bubble forever and ever. I mean, it looks like, a, a, okay, we see it that it's something crazy. It's a Ponzi scheme, but it, it's not going to explode because these monopolies have so much liquidity that they are, have the ability to keep inflating it. How, how do you think it, it will anyway somehow explode? I, I mean, uh, it's just delaying how powerful is this new tool. A bubble has no means of support. A bubble is overhead. A bubble has to keep growing exponentially. And any interest rate is a doubling time. Well, the United States uh, and Europe tried to say, well, okay, we're going to uh, reduce uh, interest uh, near zero, so you're not going to have to pay interest. And yet the debt went out anyway because people were borrowing even more at low interest than they were borrowing at, uh, uh, at high interest, uh, so uh, but they had to repay the uh, principal, uh, not the not the interest carrying charge, but the principal that they borrowed itself. So you have an enormous growth in debt, and the debt of the ninety percent of the American population and the European population is the wealth of the ten percent, and this uh, all this growth in stock market value, in uh, bond markets, uh, and in, has accrued to the wealthiest 10% of the population. But that's the tumor. So uh, the tumor has grown and the body is shrunk and all of a sudden the body cannot support this, uh, uh, this uh, bubble anymore. The bubble isn't just air. The bubble is a heavy overhead. The bubble is a tumor on the economy and it's a tumor that sucks more and more out of the economy. It pretends that the, the bubble is part of the economy itself and part of the economic body, but it's not part of the economic body. It's a, it's a growth on the economic bottle uh, of a financial tumor. And uh, right now uh, you're having in the United States and Europe uh, a, a huge uh, falling due of the debts for commercial real estate. But uh, the commercial real estate prices are, uh, uh, are falling because more and more uh, buildings are being empty. If you have uh, the bubble sucking the life out of the economy, uh, you don't need uh, uh, office buildings. You don't need factory buildings. Uh, they're all empty. And now uh, the, uh, 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 real estate speculators have borrowed money from the banks to buy office buildings that can't pay the rent and without can't, can't pay uh, the debt that they've taken on because they're not getting rent. 
And if you have an uh, office buildings in New York with 40 percent occupancy, they're not going to pay the mortgages that fall due next year, uh, this year, uh, 2024 uh, uh, and 2025. Uh, they're going to default and uh, the banks uh, are going to uh, be insolvent. Is the government going to keep lending the banks uh, more and more money like uh, President uh, uh, did in 2008? Uh, and you're going to have another Obama depression uh, even more? Well, uh, the, the banks basically are uh, paper tigers. Uh, they, uh, there's no vis visible wealth there. It's fictitious wealth. How long can Western economies uh, support the fiction that this uh, bubble of debt service and financial claims and rent claims and monopoly claims is actually real wealth when uh, we're not producing anything and we're more and more dependent on Eurasia and the global south for our raw materials uh, through uh, 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 actual manufactured goods. Uh, there is no visible means of, of support. Uh, so uh, the, the bubble can't go on. Uh, uh, the, the basic principle that I've been saying for uh, 30 years is a debt that can't be paid won't be paid. And the question is, how won't it be paid? Will it be paid by massive foreclosure uh, on uh, all these buildings? Who's going to foreclose? Will the banks end up owning uh, these buildings uh, that they're foreclosing on, the empty buildings? Uh, what does the bank do? It needs someone to... Uh, uh, actually operate them and to maintain them, uh, the, will all these buildings simply decay and fall apart? Uh, the situation here is much more uh, serious than it is in China. Uh, and uh, the result is going to be uh, already uh, this week, you had uh, the community, the New York Community Bank uh, it went insolvent and can't pay its debt. So you have uh, the beginning of uh, local community banks that have recycled uh, that have borrowed uh, uh, deposits and uh, money from the government uh, to invest in commercial real estate, leading the crisis. Private real estate uh, is leading the crisis. Uh, uh, as you have labor being fired, it can't afford to pay rents, or if it uh, uh, owns a house on mortgage, it can't pay the mortgage. You're having uh, the debt crisis unfolding, uh, uh, and that's what happens to a financialized finance capitalist economy. You're seeing financial capitalism itself collapse in the West. What's it going to do? Is it going to say, we made a mistake 100 years ago, and we're going to pick up the uh, uh, development where uh, China and Eurasia has followed? What are we going to do? That's what's happening today. Alessandro. Yes, Michael, uh, since we have already talked about uh, almost everything, uh, um, I had just one uh, last uh, brief question about uh, our country, Italy. And uh, in particular, uh, I'd like to ask you if you are uh, optimistic or whether pessimistic about uh, the role that uh, Italy could play in uh, Europe and uh, in the world uh, in this process of creating uh, this uh, multipolar uh, world in which we all uh, hope. Well, I'm very optimistic for Europe. It's going to collapse. Uh, and when it collapses, what's going to come out of it? Uh, if it collapses, uh, there will either be barbarism or socialism. And I'm hoping that the collapse, I'm optimistic that the collapse will not be barbarism, but it will find, it will realize that the United States uh, and England have led it into a blind alley. Thatcherism and Reaganomics did not make it rich. And uh, uh, it will try to rejoin the rest of Eurasia. This will probably take 20 or 1,000 years, uh, uh, 20 or 30 years, sorry, not 1,000 years, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, but I'm optimistic that in 20 years, uh, after the economy collapses, uh, uh, Europe will uh, see that uh, it, it doesn't want to fall back into feudalism. It's already had feudalism, uh, and uh, it'll permit an alternative. Uh, I do realize that the financial class uh, and the uh, American-sponsored ruling class in Europe is going to do everything to prevent uh, socialism. It will make socialist parties illegal. 
it will pretend to mount uh, uh, fake uh, assassinations and fake crises like it did in Italy. It will fight Europe just like it fought uh, Italy in the 1960s and 1970s, but I'm optimistic that this fight will fail and the Europeans, uh, and maybe led by Italy, uh, will help lead, lead it into an alternative and say that Margaret Thatcher was wrong. There is an alternative to barbarism, and the alternative is socialism. So, um, Michael, um, we thank you very much for uh, this uh, for this conversation, and uh, it, um, I'm sure it, uh, it's going to be very inspiring, especially for the people in Italy that still don't know your uh, thoughts and uh, and work. And uh, we we hope that uh, we will have you again with us, and. Um, I also thank uh, everyone who listened to us uh, and uh, I wish you all a uh, good evening. Thank, thank you so much, Michael.